It's so good to be worshiping with you today. Uh, this is our third all online service. And I just want to say how thankful I am for the character of all the Compassion Christians, man, moving uh, with the needs of our culture right now. And I'm especially thankful for Pastor Harrison for stepping in to teach for me last week. You're not going to believe this, but on the Monday after our first online service, man, when I woke up, my eyes were swollen shut. I could not believe it. And so I went to the doctor. And let me tell you, that was an experience. You know, go to the doctor during this COVID-19 thing and just watch what happens, right? And then I finally get in there and they tell me I've got shingles on my optical nerve. And by the way, Jennifer, hi. She was my nurse at my daughter's office. And man, she's a compassion Christian. Uh, and she's there serving, putting herself at risk to help people in need. And I just want to thank you and my doctor and the whole staff up there. Uh, thank God for you. Way to go, right? So anyway, they said, Kim, you got shingles on your uh, forehead and on down, down this side. So you need to go to an ophthalmologist so that you know, don't lose that eye. And so I go to the ophthalmologist and he takes a look at my eye and it says, man, you're all good. That's good to go. And then I invited him to compassion. And he said, well, I already go to another church somewhere. He said, but I go to a church that's really old and we don't have an online service. So I've been watching your online service. And I was like, man, praise the Lord. So doc, if you're watching today, thank you for you and your family joining us online. And we hope this will be a blessing to you. And thank you and everybody at your office for serving those who are in need, you know, through these critical days. Now, let me just tell you the bottom line. I'm not sure I do have the shingles, but but if I do, your prayers healed me. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of that, man. And I feel great and I'm glad to be here for, with you for this service. Now, I also want to remind you that you know, you got to know by now, our church is not just a service. Listen, we have services every week, multiple services every week, and now multiple services online. But guys, Compassion Christian is so much more than just a worship service. Listen, this past week on every campus, we had pastors and volunteers call every elderly person in our church just to make sure they're doing okay. Can we get you some food, some prescriptions? How can we help? Uh, many of those groups are keeping in touch using Zoom uh, meetings or Google Hangout or, you know, what they're staying connected. Uh, through these digital uh, opportunities. Man, our Lighthouse ministry has just been super busy providing food and serving people in need at our Henderson campus, East Effingham and Statesboro campuses. Literally hundreds of families have been blessed, you know, because of the generosity that you have demonstrated. Man, our PAC ministry serves thousands of elementary children in, in our, you know, region every month. And friends, last week, our church packed and delivered 3,000 bags of food to 3,000 kids who were out of school where they would typically get two out of their three meals every day. Now, I heard some amazing stories about how God just provided, you know, for families right on time. But friends, you got to know that generous volunteers like you serving and giving, man, you make that kind of compassion possible. Now, historically, followers of Jesus have always done the best of things in the hardest of times. And I just want to thank you for your generous giving through these challenging days. I mean, it's kind of funny. The question I get asked the most is, where do I mail my check? Because, you know, we've got folks that are used to coming and bringing their offering and drop it in the offering box and they don't know how to get it to the church now. And so we put the address, you know, where you can mail your check in on our Web page. And so you can find that. But I'll tell you, at times like this, I am so glad that I am set up as a recurring giver uh, online. Listen, I know my tithe is going to my Lord right on time every week. And it's making the kind of difference that you can see our church making every day. And if you want help getting set up on a, a recurring gift at our app or whatever, man, just call the church and we'll be glad to talk you through that. But let me just say also, we have a number of missionaries who have been deployed overseas that we have asked to come home uh, because of this coronavirus issue. We've had missionaries come back from Asia. We've had some come back from Africa. Uh, some of them have just decided to hunker down right where they are. But I just want to ask you to please pray for the amazing people that our church has deployed offshore. Pray for them to get home safely. I mean, this time will be very valuable. We'll be able to download with them and strategize about future advances in that. But you've got to know your faith promise giving makes it possible for you know, us to get these folks and their little kids home to a safe place. Uh, one of our missionaries that we asked to come home is a single woman. Uh, she's got a health issue that compromises her health, especially with this pandemic. And her, she serves in a Muslim country, so I can't even tell you what her name is. But where she serves, the closest hospital was five hours away. And so, friends, we ask her to come home. And she has come home, and thank God for that. But on her behalf and on behalf of lots of other missionary, you know, 
folks that have come back to Savannah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. Let me also say, remember next week is Easter week. Uh, we're planning a very special online celebration of the historic event that changed everything. And man, I'm praying we'll have the biggest resurrection celebration ever. So please send a link for you know this service to all of your friends, invite them to join us. And then after Easter, we're launching a series that we're calling The Elephant in the Room. Uh, we're going to let you pick the messages that we, that we talk about during this series, and you just send in the topics that you think are like an elephant in the room. I mean, everybody sees it, but nobody wants to talk about it at church, and you're going to hear more about this at the end of the service, but you just send us your questions, and we'll talk about as many of them as we can in the two or three weeks after Easter. But today, today, I don't have to tell you that our culture is struggling with a virus of anxiety. Well, not really everybody. <laughs> you know, many sociologists believe that this sheltering at home season that we're in right now is going to create a huge baby boom in the future, which means before long, we'll have a whole new generation that will emerge and then we'll have to name that generation. And I think that when the first of them turn 13, we should call them the quarantines. T too soon, you think? Okay, okay, all right, well, well listen. For those of us who are struggling with anxiety about COVID-19, and let me tell you, that's all of us. We've had the first people in our church diagnosed with co uh, the coronavirus, and we're praying for them, and I hope you'll pray for them. Because we're all struggling with a little bit of anxiety, we've been unpacking the one passage in the New Testament that has literally helped millions of believers face extraordinary uncertainty with amazing courage. So I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 8. We've been digging down in this passage for a long time. Friends, looking for the wisdom of God for these challenging days. And I want to encourage you to memorize this passage because I'm telling you, if you do, you will quote these verses to people a dozen times every year for the rest of your life. Now, my buddy Richard, who goes to our East Campus, told me this was the first verse he ever memorized after he got saved. And he said, I, only the Lord knows how many times I've shared this verse and prayed this verse over people ever since then. Now, take a look at this picture. This is the Guzda family from Poland, and they're serving with us here at uh, Compassion until May. They are extraordinary people. And so I asked them if my boy Samuel there, who is 11 years old, would memorize these verses and then come and quote them for you. And that's what my plan was. But unfortunately, you know, this social distancing thing kind of messed that up. But Samuel did memorize this passage in English and Polish. And if he can memorize it in two languages, surely the rest of us can memorize it in one language. But until you do, uh, let's just say it all together. Now, you've got your Bible open, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 4. Let's just read this in full voice wherever you are at home, uh, where, wherever else you might be. Here we go. Kids, you lead the way on this, right? Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and then the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, you know, I had a, a friend who was a professor at uh, Ozark Christian College and at Hope International University out in California, and his name was Nofel Staten. Now, Nofel taught Greek and theology. I mean, he was just a, a brainiac, and he was such an enthusiastic personality that literally sometimes he would jump up on the desk in the front of the class just to make a point. But before he became a Bible college professor, he was the chief air traffic controller at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, which was at the time the busiest airport in the world. And dude, Nofel had some stories, man. It was crazy. He talked about sitting up in that tower where a million flights a year made it super crazy, chaotic. I mean, long before the technology that we have now. And dude, they just had to make split second decisions. They had to decide what plane is going to land where and when. And dude, he would tell you stories about near misses that they had to deal with back in the day, which just makes me wonder why I flew at all back in the day. But he would say every decision I made in that situation had life and death consequences. Every decision was about life and death. And he said, you know what? That's just the life of an air traffic controller. Those life and death decisions come with the job. 
And friends, when Paul teaches us how to overcome anxiety today, he's going to say pretty much the same thing. He's going to say, if you want to live a life of calm, when, when everything in life is just pressing in on you, you got to become the air traffic controller of your mind. You got to decide what thoughts you allow to land in your mind. And I mean, over time, you got to get really good at this. So let me summarize what Paul is going to teach us here. First of all, he's going to say the thoughts that land in your mind are controllable. They're controllable. Now, I know what some of y'all are thinking. Kim, I can't control every thought that comes into my mind. Well, guess what? I know that. I can't control every thought that comes into my mind either. But it's kind of like that air traffic controller. He didn't, you know, control every plane that flew in Illinois. But he did have the power to control the ones that landed at O'Hare. And this is what Paul is going to teach us today. We don't control every thought that comes into our mind, but we do control the thoughts that we allow to land there. You know, somebody said, you don't control whether a bird flies over your head, but you can control if it, you know, builds a nest in your hair. And that's why Paul is saying in verse eight, man, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, dude, that, that's what you want settling in your mind. And if you want freedom from anxiety, Paul says, you got to learn to think about these things. You think about these things. I mean, just like an air traffic controller, here's your list of what you're going to allow to land in your mind. And let me tell you, no trash is going to stay there for long. Now, don't you look at these two words that he ends with. It's the words think about, think about such things. The Greek word is translated think about is the Greek word logizomai. Now say it with me, y'all, logizomai. Now, I bet you can guess the English word that we get from the Greek word logizomai. You know what it is? Logic. That's the Greek word that we get our word logic from. And what Paul is teaching us in this passage is that you got to use some logic if you're going to overcome anxiety in your life, which means that one of the most powerful weapons against anxiety weighs about three pounds and sits right between your ears. Now, friends, you'll never be anxious for nothing until you learn to change the way you think. Now, let me just geek out here for a minute. That's what my boy said, Uh, because honestly, I think, you know, 2000 years later, science is finally catching up with what Paul said in the book of Philippians and, and, and science actually supports what the scripture teaches here. The scripture teaches and science is showing that God hardwired your brain to be victorious over anxiety. Now, friend, your brain was designed by God your brain was designed by God. You are not some random evolutionary accident. Dude, we are the only animal on this planet that can think like we can, because unlike all the other animals, we alone were created in the image of God. Now, neuroscientists have discovered that God created us with an emotional and a logical processing center in our brain. You've got this small almond shaped part of your brain It's called the amygdala. And it is the emotional control center of your brain. Man, when you are frightened or worried, that amygdala goes nuts. It starts releasing all kinds of chems that create an immediate emotional response in your brain and then your body. And I'm telling you, man, the amygdala, though, is connected to another part of your brain that's called the prefrontal cortex. And it's right in the very front of your brain. This is the logical control center of your brain. And friends, God created your brain so that those two functions would work together. And man, they are made to work best together. Now, a buddy of mine was helping me at the house last week and he walked around the corner of my house and right behind the LP gas tank was a big, long five foot water snake. And he scared the snake. And let me tell you, that snake scared him and his amygdala just goes super active. And, you know, your amygdala has only got one job and that is protect you from danger. And so his amygdala put him into flight mode. Dude, he saw that snake. It jumped. He jumped. Reflex response. Bam. He just got out. But, but when the amygdala went off, it also sent a signal to the prefrontal cortex, which also has a job to logically decode all these signals and then decide, is this snake actually trying to kill me? Or is it just a harmless rat eating snake that's as scared of me as I am of it? And so the prefrontal cortex starts asking logical questions. Did you hear any rattles? Did you see any rattles? Did the snake have a diamond shaped head? Does it have red and yellow stripes that touch? No. Well, then it's not a threat. You know, it's kind of like when you see an alligator at the zoo behind a three inch thick bulletproof glass. It creeps you out a little bit. 
but your prefrontal cortex says, hey, it's behind a glass wall. It's no threat. Don't worry about it. Now, friends, in week one of this series, we talked about the difference between healthy fear and toxic anxiety. You know, fear sees a threat and responds. It's a water moccasin, run. But then when your prefrontal cortex kicks in and says, well, I think it's just a rat snake and there's no danger, so you're safe. Why don't you relax? Quit running. Anxiety, on the other hand, imagines the threat and gets stuck. It doesn't move on. Whoa, man, there might be snakes everywhere. I'm never going outside again. So here's the problem. When you live with long-term anxiety, friends, your amygdala just continually pumps these chemicals that keep you in emotional flight or, or fight response all the time. I, I'm telling you, there was an author named Arthur Roche and he wrote, worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through your mind. And if it is encouraged, it will cut a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. That man died 85 years ago. But let me tell you, Dr. Carolyn Leaf and some other neuroscientists would tell you he was exact, I mean, literally right. If you allow anxiety to just linger long term over time, you chemically cut a new neural pathway into your mind that God did not design and he never intended you to have. Man, think of a neural pathway as a groove or a valley that's cut into your brain because of long-term anxiety. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like a dangerous dirt road off that super highway that connects the amygdala with your prefrontal cortex. And when you turn off on that dirt road, dude, you get bounced around. I mean, think about how big this is. God created your brain to be pliable. You know why? So that you can learn and grow and change. Scientists call this neuroplasticity. Man, we can create new pathways in our thinking. This is good news. This is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 12 when he says you need to renew your mind. Dude, this is how life change happens. But let me tell you that pliability is not all good news. It also leads to a level of vulnerability. For example, if you allow anxiety to just settle in and run you, but you never talk to anybody about it, you don't pray about it. You don't see a counselor. You don't get meds if you need some. You never deal with the spiritual reasons for that anxiety. You, along with 40 million adults in our country right now, are rewiring your brain in ways that cause the emotional part of your brain to bypass the logical part of your brain. And that makes anxiety your go-to response. And friend, that will hurt you you were not created by God to live this way. And this is why Paul tells us in Philippians chapter four, we attack anxiety with logic because every thought that lands makes a difference. Every thought. Consequently, you need to think about what you think about. You need to do an audit about the things you think about because not every thought is worthy of thinking about. I mean, just because it pops into your mind or occurs to you doesn't mean it's real or true. Man, Paul is calling us to restrain our mind and actually think about what we're constantly thinking about and then decide whether we're going to allow certain thoughts to land in our mind or not. And friends, I'm telling you, science agrees with the New Testament. There are thought patterns that are destructive to you spiritually and physically if you allow them to linger in your head. So I know what you're thinking, Cam. What am I supposed to do, bro? What am I supposed to do? I mean, how am I supposed to know what kind of thoughts I should allow to land in my mind? Well, the good news is in verse eight, Paul tells us, he tells us right here. Look at verse eight. Finally, brothers, he says, whatever is true. Now think about that. That right there eliminates a lot of toxic thoughts. You know what true means? Not imaginary. It's not just an imaginary fear. You, you're going to think about what is true. Remember, man, that toxic anxiety imagines these worst case scenarios all the time, most of which never come to pass. But dude, if you allow these imaginary threats to, uh, you just obsess on it, it'll paralyze you. So if it's not true, don't let it land, right? If it ain't true, it's not getting any rent in your brain. Nobody loves me. That's not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell, man. God loves you. Jesus loves you. We've got a church full of people who will love you if you let us. Don't let that kind of trashy thinking even land in your mind. 
Paul says, rather, whatever is noble. Now think about that word. You know what noble means? That's the you that you hope everybody's going to remember. That's the you who builds and leaves a great legacy. You know what that noble person does? He does what is right and what is pure. You know what she lives for? She lives for what is lovely and what is admirable. Paul goes on to say, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, listen, think about such things. That's what you let land in your heart and your mind. Now, these are things that we're just going to logically decide to focus our minds on. Now, I love the way the New King James Version translates that word legizomai. Instead of saying think, think on these things, it says meditate, meditate on these things. The New American Standard Version says dwell on these things. Don't dwell on what you're afraid of. Don't dwell on what you're worried about. Dwell on these excellent things. I love that. Now, Max Locato says these four verses give us a great prescription for staying calm in the midst of any crisis. Now, think about the word calm as an acrostic. The C stands for celebrate. We talked about that the first week of this series. God is near. God is good. God is in control. He loves you. You ought to celebrate that in your mind. The A stands for ask. Ask. Uh, Pastor Harrison talked about this last week. Don't be anxious for anything, but by prayer and supplication, pray about everything. Ask for God's help with everything. Ask him. Lost your job? Ask him for another one. You need food? Ask him to help. You lost your health? Ask him to heal. Lost your nerve? Ask him for courage. So C, celebrate. A, ask. L is list. 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 List all the times that you've gone to God in the past and he's come through for you. So you don't take him for granted. Let, let him remind you that you're not alone in the present. And then the M stands for meditate. Meditate only on what is good. Now, if you want to be calm when everybody else is panicking, this is the spiritual solution. Now, you may honestly have a physical reason that you need to go to the doctor. You need to get medical help. You need to take some medication for a while. And if so, I hope you will. I hope you will. But this is first. This addresses the spiritual side of your problem. Now, I'm telling you, I have a really close friend who ignored the spiritual side of her anxiety, and she jumped right over that to prescription drugs and escapist behavior, and it ruined her life, and it ruined the lives of a lot of people who love her. Don't make that mistake. Start with the spiritual solution and then work to the physical needs. Now, let me talk with you a minute about meditation because this is powerful. There's a lot of misunderstanding about meditation in our culture today. Now, for some of you, when you even hear that word, you know what you think of? You think of somebody sitting in a lotus position with their legs crossed, arms out, trying to envy their mind by doing alms. Um, um, and I'm going to tell you that is not a biblical concept. Not a biblical concept. Everybody say not. I'm going to trust that you did. I can't hear you, but I'm going to trust that you did. You know, Eastern meditation, which is, has its roots in Buddhism and Taoism and all that, it's a philosophy that encourages you to try to find peace by emptying your mind. And friends, that, oper that operates on a presumption that the solution is somewhere in you. And if you can just dial the noise down, man, a solution will eventually emerge and it'll calm you down. Friends, that is the opposite of what Jesus practiced. And it's the opposite of what Paul is teaching here. Listen, the people you admire most in the Bible practice meditation. It's all through the scripture. But I cannot find a single place that talks about meditating by emptying your mind. Now, I know people who are advocates for that, and, and I guess it seems to help sometime because I think it does kind of turn down the volume on anxious thoughts that should never be landing in your mind in the first place. But friends, emptying your mind offers no solution. Those religions don't even believe in God. Paul is encouraging meditation that does not empty your mind. He says, do the opposite. Fill it. Fill it with good things. Now, let me show you an example, uh, example from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, awesome. Verse 15 says, I will meditate on nothing. I'll try to empty my mind. No. He says, you meditate on the precepts of the scripture, the truth of the scripture. I will meditate on your precepts. I will think, I will consider your ways. Lord, I'm going to delight. This is what I'm going to spend my time thinking about in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Man, I'm going to fill my mind with that word every day. Now, friends, can I just tell you, if you can worry, you can, you can meditate, right? 
I mean, if you can worry about stuff, dude, you can meditate on God's word. Amen. And I promise you, if you want a new chapter in your life to begin, you need to start turning the pages of God's word in a regular way. You know, the Center for Biblical Engagement surveyed 40,000 Americans from eight to 80 years old. And they made a discovery that they were not looking for. They were excited about it, but they weren't looking for it. They found that people who only read the Bible one day a week. Now, that would be like the person who comes to church and lets me read it for you. OK, no difference in their life. Almost no difference in their negligible difference in terms of peace, uh, absence of anxiety, life change. Dude, reading the Bible once a week. I mean, it makes very little difference in anybody's life. Then they found that those who read the Bible twice a week, same thing, negligible difference. Uh, you, know, you know how it is. You put very little in, you're going to get very little out. But they found that people who read the Bible three times a week, I mean, it's like every other day. It was interesting that these folks all said they began to see positive energy, spiritual energy in their spiritual life. It was kind of like an uptick on an EKG machine, man. They started to see a difference because, you know, they're in the Bible every other day. And here's what shocked the researchers. Those who read the Bible four days a week saw a huge spike in their spiritual life. They could literally point to their life and see compelling evidence of life change when they started reading the Bible four times a week. Look what they said. Feeling lonely dropped 30 percent. Anger issues dropped 32 percent. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40 percent. Alcoholism dropped 57 percent. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60 percent. Viewing pornography dropped 61 percent. But then look what they said about the positive mileage that they began to see because they were meditating on God's word. Sharing their faith jumped up 200 percent. Serving and discipling other folk jumped up 230 percent. I mean, do you think reading and meditating on God's word will make a difference in your life? It absolutely will. I mean, please join me in the New Testament challenge. We're reading one chapter a day, five days a week. We're going to read through the entire New Testament this year. It's on Instagram every day. Check it out. You know, Eugene Peterson, who's the translator of the message translation of the Bible, he said Christians don't simply learn or study or use scripture. We assimilate it. We take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love. Dude, when we feed our mind on things that are true and good and right, we start doing things that are true and good and right. And let me tell you, there's a lot of great resources out there. We're trying to provide some through our Right Now Media, and you can learn about that on our website. But friends, the New Testament is the single most indispensable tool for building a strong, God-honoring life. Man, the New Testament tells us how to build a life and a marriage and how to handle money and how to resolve conflict. And it tells us all about life after death and, you know, how we can get right with God and spend eternity with Jesus when we die. The New Testament is like a moral compass. It helps us know the difference between right and wrong, between true and false. Man, if we meditate on God's word every day, if we feed our mind on it over time, God will use it to transform you into his best version of you. And so, friends, to battle anxiety, you don't need to empty your mind. You need to fill it, fill it, fill it with what God says is good. Now, I'm going to try to give you an illustration of this that helps me uh, because this is just an important truth to learn. Because, listen, calm people who celebrate and ask and list and, and meditate, calm people decide what thoughts get to land in their life. And I know we've got lots of kids with us. And so, man, I hope you will uh, hang with me on this thing. Uh, I'm getting ready to make a mess over here. Uh, and so why don't you come and join me? OK, here we go. I'm going to move over this way. Y'all with me? Here we go. All right. Now, friends, this jar, <clears throat> this represents your mind. And you know what? It's about the size of an adult human mind. And, and you've got to know that Satan hates you. And he's going to try to land a 747 worth of anxious thoughts in your mind every day. And if you allow him to do that, if you allow those thoughts to land, I'm telling you, you're just going to get racked with the what ifs, the what ifs of life. You know, this is what Max Licato says is like a meteor shower that just hits us. Man, what, what if I lose my job? Uh, what if I get ruined financially? Uh, what if something bad happens to my kids? What if that stress of all that causes my marriage to break? Man, what if nobody ever loves me? What if, what if, what if, what if? right? And so here's the thing, man. If you're not careful, 
You ask those what ifs, what if, what if, what if, until your mind is just full of the darkest, most anxious, imaginable thoughts. And man, it's just brutal. Now, let me ask you a question. How can you live a joy-filled life, you know, with a fear-filled mind? Can't. Dude, how can you live a positive life with a negative mind? You can't do it. Now, listen, this is why some of you are watching this service right now. God loves you and God wants you to know that your life is on a direct path to the place your thoughts are leading you. And if you've got dark, negative, anxious thoughts, it's going to lead you to a dark, negative, anxious place. And that's why God's got you here today. He's going to encourage you to get this mess out of your mind to discipline what you allow to spend time in your mind. But now here we are, we're empty. This is what the Buddhists say, just try to empty your mind. Jesus said, emptying your mind could be catastrophic. Catastrophic, man. Now I know, I know some of y'all are thinking, well, Cam, you know, my husband lives like this every day. I, 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 I doubt that. I think he probably just doesn't talk as much as you do. And, and that's why you think that, all right? But listen, how, how can you be a good friend or a good spouse or raise good kids? Or do a good job at work with an empty mind. You, you just can't do it. And so what, what are you going to do? You're going to try to empty your mind of anxious thoughts, but you know what happens? They just keep coming, man. They keep coming. The coronavirus, uh, my job just got laid off. They're cutting back in my job. There's all kind of negative stuff that you're hearing. And it just has that, that ability to just fill your mind. And, and you think, well, I'm going to try to empty it, but you know what? It'll fill back up. You know why? My buddy, Marshall Leggett, who's a great pastor. He was the president of Milligan College. He just died last month. I mean, he was a hero to me. But Marshall Leggett used to say, nature abhors a vacuum. Nothing can live in a vacuum. And so your mind is never gonna be empty. The question is, what are you gonna fill it with? And here's what Paul is recommending that we do. We take God's word and man, we start filling our mind with God's word by reading it every day. And we fill it by making a list of all the good things that God has done in our life and how many times he's loved us and cared for us. And we just go to worship and we read on our own and we just keep reading until it just gets bigger and bigger. And we're like, okay, my mind is full. Not yet. I'm going to pack it down in here, baby. I'm going to make that thing strong. I'm just going to jack my mind full of God's word. And I'm going to keep filling and keep filling and keep filling until, man, it just runs over the top. Now, let me tell you, when you're reading every day, and you're listing all the things you have to be thankful for, and you're intentionally filling your mind with what is true and noble and good and pure and right and lovely and admirable, let me tell you how this works. Anxious thoughts are going to come. I mean, they're going to come. It's inevitable. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. But man, when your mind is just filled with God's word, when those anxious thoughts come, look what happens. It runs off the side. It doesn't fill your mind. It may stick a little bit, uh, not, not, not that much. All right, there you go. But the truth is your mind is already so full of God's word and good theology and good values and godly truth that there's just not a lot of room for those anxious thoughts to land. Of course, you're going to struggle with them every now and then. Of course, you're going to have to deal with this occasionally, but your mind is filled with something really good. And so, man, when those other hard thoughts come, There's no room for them. Now, this is how the Apostle Paul is going to encourage you to live your life. He's going to encourage you to fill your mind with those thoughts that honor God and build a life of peace and calm. Now, you know, when you get on an airplane here in Savannah, sometimes they'll take you out on the runway and the pilot will come on and he'll say, we're doing a ground stop. And a ground stop means that basically the weather is bad at your destination. And so they're going to hold you on the ground in Savannah because they can't land your airplane wherever you're going, Atlanta or, you know, wherever you may be. Dude, wouldn't it be cool if you got so good at celebrating God's goodness and his control in your life and then asking God for help? I mean, instead of worrying, you just go straight to prayer. And then listing examples of all the time that God's favor and God's goodness has manifested itself in your life. And then meditating on the promises of God's word. Wouldn't it be cool if your mind was so full of those good things that there wasn't a place for anxious thoughts to land for long? 
I'm telling you, it's so much easier to eliminate this toxic, anxious stuff when you are regularly filling your mind with what is good and noble and excellent and worthy of praise. Friends, let's remember, we don't control what, flights, uh, what, what thoughts fly over our mind, but we do control which ones we allow to land and linger. And you know who put on a clinic on this? You know who did this better than anybody else? We celebrate his victory this weekend every year at Compassion. It was Jesus. Every year, the week before Resurrection Sunday, uh, you know, and I hope you're inviting all your friends to come and celebrate Easter with us. We're going to have 35 services. It's going to be awesome. But for years now, we've called this weekend Passion Week because we think about how Jesus voluntarily went through so much for us. You know, we, we think about the betrayal and the attack and the isolation he endured. We think about the suffering and the physical and mental suffering, the weakness he endured. We think about the pain and the loneliness. And eventually we think about his death on the cross so that he could pay the price for all of our sin. Dude, how in the world did he do that? How did he do it? How did he walk into that storm knowing how bad the storm was going to be, knowing what was awaiting him there? How did he stay calm when he was going through so much agony? I think Paul tells us right here. I think for Jesus, his logic overpowered his emotion. He celebrated the goodness and the sovereignty of God. His trust was in his father. He asked God for help. Listen, he asked God for help in the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked during the beating. He asked on the cross. He found strength and the will to finish the job because he prayed his way through his hardship. And listen, he had a long list of times that the father had blessed him and cared for him and, and you know, worked through him and then came through for him. And I mean, if you study this, and we'll talk about this next week, even on the cross, Almost everything Jesus said came from Psalm 22, because even as he was dying, he meditated on God's word and he found strength and peace. And friends, I'm just telling you, no matter what we face, if we would do what Jesus did, then like Jesus, we can be anxious for nothing. We can cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. Now, can I just say, because I love you, if you're here today and you have never given your life to Christ, and I mean, I'm not talking about going to church. Going to church is one thing. Becoming a follower of Christ is something totally different. If you have never declared your faith publicly, if you've never repented of your sin and asked Jesus to be the forgiver and leader of your life, if you've never been baptized into Christ to declare, you know, the death of the old you and the birth of the new you, man, that's your next step. That's your next step. Maybe the reason you're so cut up with anxiety is that you don't have those resources in your heart yet. And I want to encourage you to get on the chat right now and just tell somebody, I need to give my life to Christ. And that conversation will begin. Do celebrate what Jesus did on the cross for you. Tell somebody, go to the chat, ask them, how can I become a follower of Christ? If, if you need prayer today, ask, ask. We've got people right now who are ready to pray for you. And they'll list some of the ways that Jesus and, and his father will be good to you in the future because he's been that good to us in the past. And after this message, we've got a couple discussion questions we're going to talk about so that you can meditate on God's word and grow strong. But friend, I just want to encourage you to take that next step, whatever it is for you. Father, thank you for this time we've had to be together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the strength it brings to us. And I pray, God, that you would use this service to free somebody from anxiety today. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Before we let you go, we want to just take a second to give you a few questions to reflect on as we uh, take off. And the first question is this, what category in your life tends to cause you the most anxiety? Is it finances, appearance, maybe your relationships, maybe it's unexpected hardship, health, being around people, wondering if you'll ever be loved. These are really hard questions and we want you to wrestle those to the ground. The second question we want to leave you with is what verse in the Bible could you meditate on that speaks directly to that anxiety? If you don't know, ask a friend or search for it. Again, we just want to say thank you for making a difference here and now. With your tithes and offerings, you are making a difference in the lives of so many. We had a great time with you and we hope to see you next week.